Thank you for joining us. We are going to get started in about one minute. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rick Hassan. I'd like to welcome everyone to the first installment of the fall 2023 webinar series for the Safeguarding Democracy Project at UCLA Law. I wanna thank Harley Hamm and Ben Austin DeCampo for their important logistical support today. And I wanna tell you about the upcoming programs of the Safeguarding Democracy Project. All of our programs are free, but registration is required. On September 26th at 12.15 p.m. Pacific time, I'll be in conversation with Josh Lawson, formerly of Meta, and Yoel Roth, formerly of Twitter, on the topic, how should platforms handle election speech and disinformation in 2024? This event will be online, but it will also be live at the UCLA Law School. It's co-sponsored with UCLA's, uh, UCLA Law's Institute for Technology, Law, and Policy. On Thursday, October 12th at noon Pacific, I will discuss the Roberts Court in American Democracy with CNN journalist Joan Biskupic. She's the author of the new book, Nine Black Robes. On Tuesday, October 17th at 12.15 p.m. Pacific time, Gen Genevieve Lockyer and Eugene Volokh will join me in conversation on the Trump prosecutions, the First Amendment, and election interference. This event will be online, but also will be live at UCLA Law School. Then on October, uh, and then on November 16th at noon Pacific, Pam Fessler, formerly of NPR, will be moderating a great panel called Covering the Risks to Elections on the State and Local Level, the Views of Beat Reporters. We'll hear from Jonathan Lai, Carrie Levine, Patrick Marley, and Yvonne Winget Sanchez. Links for all of these events are on the SDP website, safeguardingdemocracyproject.org. As I said, they are free but registration is required. Today's topic is a very important one, the Trump indictments, the 2024 elections and the public peace. Seems very appropriate first topic for uh, the beginning of our uh, fall webinar series. We have an incredible panel of experts to explore these issues today. I'll, I'll briefly mention their biographies and we'll be putting links to their bios uh, in the chat. Uh, Ruth ben Giat is professor of history and Italian studies at New York University. She writes about fascism, authoritarianism, propaganda, and democracy protection. She's the recipient of the Guggenheim and other fellowships, an advisor to protect democracy, and an MSNBC opinion columnist. Um, her latest book, Strong Men, Mussolini to the Present, examines how illiberal leaders use corruption, violence, propaganda, and machismo to stay in power, and how resistance to them has unfolded over a century. Benjamin Ginsburg is the Volcker Distinguished Visiting uh, Fellow uh, at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He represents numerous political parties, political campaigns, candidates, members of Congress and state legislatures, governors, corporations, trade association, vendors, donors, and individuals participating in the political process. He represents clients on a variety of election law issues. Um, uh, he uh, formerly uh, was a partner at Jones Day he served as national counsel to the Bush-Cheney presidential campaign in 2004 and 2000. He played a central role in the 2000 Florida recount. In 2012 and 2008, he served as national counsel for the Romney for President campaign. Rachel Kleinfeld is senior fellow at, in the Carnegie's Democracy, Conflict, and Governance Program. Her work on troubled democracies 
facing problems such as polarized populations, violence, corruption, and poor governance, bridges the United States in international cases. Her focus on the intersection of democracy and security has led her to regularly brief the governments of the United States and allied democracies on issues of conflict, the rule of law, and policing and security sector reform. And she's consulted for international organizations, including the European Union, OECD, and the World Bank. She serves on the United Nations Security Sector Reform Advisory Group and probably served on the Agenda Committee of the Halifax International Security Forum, where she is currently a fellow. Welcome to you all. Um, I'm going to begin with uh, an initial set of questions uh, for our panelists, uh, then get into a bit of back and forth with them. And I'd like to include your questions. Uh, if you're watching this live, uh, you may put your questions in the Q&A box, and I will try to get to them uh, as soon as I can. Uh, so let me welcome the panelists and ask you all to turn on your cameras. And I, I want to begin uh, with uh, Ben Ginsburg. Um, in the middle uh, of the Trump indictment, uh, and the federal Trump indictment and other uh, events connected to the attempt to overturn the results of the 2020 elections, Ben, uh, you told the Washington Post, I think we are in as precarious a situation as we've ever been. And you said, I don't know what the chances are of things really going off the rails, but no question that there is a toxic mix unprecedented in the American experiment. I have to say, Ben, when I read those remarks, it actually uh, caused me to want to have this panel um, because I thought this was an issue worth more fully airing. So what did you mean by that? What are you worried about? Uh, and where do you see things uh, going from here? Ben, you're muted. It wouldn't be a Zoom without uh, someone muting. There we go. I am unmuted, I believe. Yes. Thank you. First of all, thanks for uh, thanks for putting on this really important session. Thanks for having me. It looks like a great lineup uh, you have for the fall. Um, those remarks that you referred to uh, really were born of sort of five confluent factors uh, that I saw at the time and, and still see, if not even more emphasized today. First factor is we're an incredibly polarized country today. And while that's not unprecedented, uh, it's also not usual for us and really sets the background uh, for, much of the, um, for much of what we're going through. Secondly, we've never had so many people in our country who have doubted the fundamental reliability of our elections, the reliability and fairness. And that has and can take a huge toll on faith in the institution of elections <clears throat> and therefore the fundamentals of the government itself. We've also never had a former president uh, running for election who's under indictment. And while he's running for election, he's also claiming that our elections are rigged. Never had that before. Number four, uh, we do have a former president running for election who is under now four indictments. And oh yeah, two of those indictments come from his opponent's Justice Department. And number five, while that former president was running for election before uh, with a central tenet of his campaigns that elections were rigged, there's now a considerable body of evidence that shows he in fact was trying to rig the outcome of that election himself. So what am I worried about? Well, I'll defer to Rachel uh, on political violence and her incredible expertise on that subject. Um, but I would, and what worries me is that while the danger that comes from the right and from my Republican party is emphasized a lot, uh, it does, make me indeed fearful when I think what Democrats would do if the existential threat to them of Trump being reelected is realized. And then you've essentially got both sides of the political spectrum with huge doubts about the validity of, of elections and what that means for the peaceful transfer of power. Um, that loss of faith in the reliability of elections is really what worries me most 
uh, as someone who's worked in elections for the last four decades. How do you have a peaceful transfer of power if people don't believe in the results uh, and all that entails and what it means for the American experiment? Um, so I do think that in terms of some constructive, constructive action to deal with this, there are some important things to do in the next 14 months. Primary among those is to build confidence back in the reliability of election results. And part of that is also listening more than those who, who do not believe in election denialism, but but listening more to those that do, because this is a country that's riven apart now over this subject. And it's that divisiveness that's causing us huge problems. So there are some specifics. Um, number one is that uh, there needs to be a broader discussion and education into all the safeguards that are built into the election system. Today, if you're sort of trying to counter the arguments of election deniers, it's a game of whack-a-mole. There's one phase of the election process that they attack, those attacks are answered, then it shifts to something else. For example, risk-limiting audits uh, are a great feature to, to ensure the reliability of results, but now the argument springs up from election deniers that, well, risk-limiting audits really don't tell you everything because there are phony registrations in the system. So then you have to go back and justify the registration system. And secondly, as a broad bucket, it really is incumbent to support election officials, the people on the front lines who are running our elections in some 10,000 jurisdictions around the country. So while uniformity is not achievable in a place with 10,000 election jurisdictions, there are fundamentals that need to be emphasized. Um, providing pro bono legal counsel for election officials uh, is really important. Uh, community support in local communities, the answer to election denialism is more likely to occur on a local level than a national level. And then it's important to debunk the, the myths around elections. The fraud suppression industrial complex that we should talk about a little bit more whether high turnout or low turnout elections really um, impacts election results, when election results are tabulated, the reliability of mail-in voting, standards of reliability that can be agreed to in a bipartisan fashion to improve our election laws, funding for elections, elections are terribly underfunded today. <clears throat> and lastly, making sure that there are sufficient poll workers to be able to put on the elections fall into the positive side of countering the very real concerns that I think we all should have about the November 2024 election. Thanks, Ben. I'm going to want to come back to some of your points, but I want to bring in um, to the discussion uh, Rachel and Ruth. First, turning to Rachel. Rachel, you, you've long written about the risks of political violence around the world and, and in the United States long before it became something that was a focus of, of great public attention. Um, I know you were very concerned in 2020. Uh, how do you assess the risks of political violence in the country right now? And, and how does that risk compare to both historically and, and to the more recent period? Uh, what we saw, I, I still get chills looking at the pictures of the uh, invasion of the Capitol on, on January 6th. Um, what are we likely to face in the next few years? So thank you. It's such an honor to be on this panel with you and, and Ben and Ruth, and um, I'm just thrilled to be here. Um, I'm not thrilled about the topic. Obviously, one uh, who writes on political violence does not want to start writing on one's own country. Um, let me put it first in context. America does not have the levels of violence of, say, Kenya in 2007 or um, even a, a, a country like Mexico. Um, but it doesn't need that level of violence to have a very deep effect on democracy because of who is being targeted and because the level of threats so outstrip the level of violence, but an, enough violence is happening that you never know whether the threats are true or not. Um, so we're seeing political violence that has skyrocketed and depending on what, you know, uh, what you're using, um, different numbers, but 
uh, against election workers. So these are the election officials that Ben and others are really working to protect the, your, your neighbors who are going and doing uh, poll volunteering as well as the professional ones. We're seeing um, violence against specific political rivals or members of another party go up. So this is everyone from the uh, Republican commissioner in New Mexico who decided to shoot at four colleagues' houses after losing an election and shot up the house of an eight-year-old girl or the room of an eight-year-old girl um, to the Ohio man who shot a neighbor who he believed was a Democrat. Turned out he was Republican, but... Um, but you know that kind of violence specific against political rivals, and then targeted violence against minority groups and all sorts of uh, hate crimes that we used to think of as, as disaggregated from politics. But because of the specific turn our politics have taken, these are also skyrocketing. They're at the highest levels, much higher even than 9-11, after 9-11, when we saw a lot of violence against Muslim Americans. And by the way, this isn't all gun violence. The increases are not just guns, but car rammings. And, you know, Paul Pelosi was attacked with an ax. It's all sorts of things. Um, what we're seeing now is that the threat is changing. In 2020, Trump could really direct violence as what we'd call overseas a conflict entrepreneur. And he could call out large numbers of people to try to obstruct election results, as we all saw on January 6th and is now being shown in, in courts of law. That doesn't seem to be able to happen right now. What seems to be able, uh, what seems to have happened is that um, fears among his followers of false flags, FBI surveillance, um, whether true or not true, has quelled uh, that kind of mass mobilization, as well as just anger at Trump. Many of his followers felt like he should have come out monetarily supporting defendants on January 6th, and he didn't. Um, so for that reason, he's not able to call out mass threats, but he has been able to still call out threats against judges, juries, DAs directly connected to his cases. And as anyone who you know studies RICO law knows, that's not unusual in a gangland case or an organized crime case, but it's not only the indictments unusual, but to have a president of the United States threatening um, members or calling out threats against members that are trying to uh, enact the rule of law is a big issue. Then we're seeing threats move to other parts of the MAGA faction. So here it's things like um, Nevada's state Republican Party using Proud Boys uh, to fill the voting rolls of the local Clark County, which is Las Vegas Republican Party, to affect that election through some intimidation and violence, or Wyoming's uh, state Republican chair using threats of violence against Liz Cheney, another Republican, to the point where she could barely campaign in her own state because of threats. We're seeing similar things in Miami-Dade. So a uh, very targeted use of violence by one part of a party against another part of a party. We see that very commonly overseas um, because your nearest threat tends to be the group that is similar to you ideologically, but not willing to go as far as you. Um, that's your biggest competitor. And so we're seeing that kind of threat against, uh, against people growing within the Republican Party. And then finally, we're seeing vast increases of targeted violence against every form of minority group, especially women. Women are very disproportionately targeted, um, but women who are also minorities of one sort or another, even more so, especially LGBTQ. And this clearly connects with kind of methods of political organizing that have to do with how stacked and sorted our identities have become, because the Republican Party has become more homogenous and the Democratic Party more heterogeneous, although the median member of the party is actually the same. The median member of both parties is a middle-aged white, even a non-evangelical Christian. But you wouldn't know that to, to hear people talk. And so you get this kind of identity-based anger and polarization, as Ben was talking about, build up. And for more unstable parts of the population, who are not necessarily polarized, by the way, they're not even necessarily very uh, radical um, I have a paper on polarization out today um, talking about that discrepancy, but people who are a little unstable or under the influence of alcohol or what have you, they take this zeitgeist and this normalization of violence and act on it. And so we're seeing just every aspect uh, jump up, but not necessarily Trump directed except against um, his particular legal problems. Thank you for that. And uh, hopefully, uh, um... Ben uh, Austin DeCampo can find the uh, link to your paper and share it with uh, our audience in the chat. You know, Rick, I, I don't want to put off Ruth, but I realized I talked about the right. I didn't talk about the left. Can that, I was gonna be my that was going to be my um, follow-up question uh, when I came back to you. Um, okay, I'll talk about it when, when you follow up and I'll let All right, Ruth. great. 
So let's turn to Ruth. Um, you've also spent considerable time uh, looking comparatively, uh, specifically looking at things like democratic backsliding in other countries that had a uh, democratic tradition that moved towards or into authoritarianism. What does your historical and comparative perspective tell you about the conditions in the United States right now? And, and what lessons can we learn from history about how to avoid further backsliding and assure that we have continued peaceful transitions of power? Yeah, so thanks. Uh, I, UCLA is my alma mater, so I'm always happy to have anything to do with a wonderful institution. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. So, um, you know, the GOP is, is uh, a party that's undergoing what we call uh, autocratization. It's becoming an autocratic party. And um, it's a party that's now dependent on um, institutionalized lying and corruption and the reality or threat of violence to that's its that's its mode of governing. And so I'm watching how, you know, it's Rachel's of course correct that Trump doesn't have the ability to instigate mass violence, but he um, there's a kind of a spiral, excuse me. <laughs> there's a kind of spiral of radicalization that the party is in now, where because of the indictments uh, and now extending to you know many of the party elite. And so instead of parting ways with Trump, it's interesting to me in the context of uh, it's called personalist rule, these leaders who have a kind of personal control of the party and they've deepened their submission to him. Right. So we had that spectacle of the debate where the his his competitors are all but two were pledging that they would even vote for him and support him if he becomes a convicted criminal. So supporting a criminal is the essence of authoritarianism. And so is this uh, playbook of discrediting elections. And I would just add to what's been said is um, that the. It's not just discrediting and uh, elections and making it difficult for all those involved with elections so that they will uh, vacate their jobs thinking it's too difficult. That's the hollowing out uh, so that you can eventually end up with this kind of electoral autocracy where you keep elections going, but they're, they're kind of voided of, of opposition and the smooth machinery that keeps you in power can, can glide ahead. But the end game, for many people here is to debase the idea and discredit the idea of elections as a way of deciding, uh, you know, uh, political contests. And, and Tommy Tuberville uh, always can be counted on, uh, the same person who is weakening our, our global influence and our safety in the world by holding up all those military appointments. He came out and said that, you know, we shouldn't depend on elections anymore as a way of deciding. Um, and so I just want to put that in there because that's that's uh, maybe a fringe view, but it's being voiced now. So um, I'm also I'm looking at uh, some of this overlaps with uh, with what Rachel studies. This indexes of uh, the party becoming autocratic, and the way I see things is, um, you know, the period from November to January when Trump lost the election. It's very interesting to look back on because it was a kind of laboratory of autocrat autocratic methods. And it was a sorting, sorting out who was going to do, you know, what they never dreamed they would do before um, to help the leader. And, and then January 6th was, of course, a failed coup. And by the way, half of all coups that happened between 1945 and 2000 failed. It's very common to have a failed coup. But it, it, it created a spiral of radicalization. It was as though some of the, there was like this drunkenness of how much they, how close they came and how many taboos they broke. And the fact that there was no uh, prosecution beyond the foot soldiers for the most part for two years allowed the, the methods and the doctrine in a way of, of the coup to become enshrined in Republican party dogma. So it's very important by 2022, the GOP actually made an official statement saying that January 6th was, quote, legitimate political discourse. So where we are now 
is very dangerous because there's these um, things going on uh, within the party where on the one hand there's tightened discipline. It's, it's like it's the party is in a position of preparing itself to manage autocratic rule, whatever that's gonna look like in America, if they can get Trump back into the White House. So you have the, the, uh, the, the crackdown on internal dissenters. That's what Rachel was talking about. Um, and, it, and all of these things are watersheds. When Eric Brightens and others, you know, they made campaign ads with assault rifles, but aimed at Republicans. Or um, I still can't get over uh, that Trump targeted Mike Pence for harm on January 6th. And it was extremely interesting to me during the recent debate of the candidates that um, whether Mike Pence did the right thing became like a subject of discussion, but nobody wanted to touch the fact that Trump put Pence in that situation in the first place, and especially not that Pence was targeted for killing and there was uh, a noose on the Capitol with his name on it. Those are, those are the, the red lines you don't cross because that interferes with the repackaging of January 6th as something we shouldn't really pay attention to. And suppressing memory of a party's crimes is part of preparing for, uh, is laying the ground to be able to commit new crimes. So the party is very caught up. This is part of the spiral of radicalization. Um, so, and then finally, you know, it's very disturbing if you, if you studied fascism, uh, it's very disturbing what going on at the local level, which was already addressed with election workers and also by racial, um, but the fact that so many sitting lawmakers are openly using the language of violence and uh, Matt Gates' um, recent comment at the Iowa State Fair of all places uh, stands out where he says only force can bring change to Washington. Now this is, this is important because he's saying that we, don't, we no longer believe in democratic reform. We don't believe in, in legislation. This is the language of a coup that we need another authoritarian action to change things. And so is the fact that the Texas GOP passed a resolution in 2022 where it no longer recognizes Biden as the legitimate president of the United States. It calls him an acting president. So all of these things make uh, for a very dangerous moment. And in terms of what, what can we do, um, I think, you know, there are a lot of bridge building organizations uh, operating in the United States. Uh, and it, this is the time to reach out to independent voters, you know, to moderates and use outcome arguments. What, you know, talking about the toll of political violence in society, the toll of the breakdown of trust in society. How is this going to be good for business? I think we haven't done enough uh, in appealing to businesses because my, my research shows, just to wrap up, that every uh, society was unprepared for what happened. In a way, every society thought it couldn't happen to them uh, and, and did not take seriously the, the, the Hitler who was, seemed like a lunatic waiter, Mussolini, people said he was like an opera character, um, and Trump, of course, is a clown. But, but it's up to us to educate people. I mean, we're all trying to do this in various ways. Uh, to let people know the outcomes of the possible outcomes of this, um, this kind of breakdown of uh, civil society. Well, those are quite sobering words. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, I have a follow up question for each of you, and then others can chime in on, on uh, and comment on what others have said. And also, I want to um, uh, remind you that you can submit questions through the Q&A function if you're watching this uh, online. Let me first come back to Rachel and ask you about the potential for violence on the left. It's something that Ben alluded to. Certainly, um, we saw a, you know, a number of, of um, uh, violent uh, actions uh, uh, over the last five years that uh, did not originate on the right. What is the potential, especially uh, given the chances of uh, a Trump victory in 2024, or, or an even, the, you know, an election where Trump is running as the Republican nominee uh, in the lead up to the election. So let me first sort of set the structure, and then I'll answer the question directly. So um, 
violence on the left and right uh, has altered since the 60s when most violence was on the left and the 60s and 70s, also vast political violence, mostly on the left. Left-wing violence tends to be against um, property, not people. And that continues to hold true that as we see left-wing violence rise and fall, it focuses more on property, although not entirely. There was the Symbionese Liberation Army, and there were also uh, pot shots taken at um, Republican members of Congress and so on. So not entirely, but more often. What we're seeing now is depending on your measure, CSIS shows uh, violence three to one on the right, the Global Terrorism Database looking at the United States shows, I think it's about five to one. Don't, don't quote me on that, it's a much higher number. We're seeing much more violence on the right than the left. But there is some violence on the left and that violence has doubled since 2012 from a much lower point. So the doubling keeps it much lower than on the right. And again, it's mostly against property. What we're also seeing is that on the right, as Ruth was saying, there's been a, a real normalization. The violence has moved into the language of normal political actors and, and so on. On the left, it still remains fringe. So on the right, when you look at who justifies political violence, there's a couple of different um, surveys that show that people who are strong Republicans, in the words of the survey, or sometimes MAGA Republicans, which means that they believe Trump was the rightful uh, elected leader in 2020, and they reject that election outcome. Uh, more often justify violence. On the left, what you see is that people who are dissatisfied with the Democratic Party are more likely to justify violence. And the particular group on the left is a group that more in common has, say, has uh, sort of singled out in some of their research as what they call activist mavericks or maybe maverick activists. They're more likely to be male. They're very wealthy. They're the wealthiest group. They're young. Almost all violence comes from young men. So that part's not surprising, but the wealth uh, is a little bit. And um, they tend to believe in violence for pro-democracy, pro-racial justice ends. So they believe that we're an imperfect democracy. We should have violence to bring about a more perfect and more racially just democracy. And they're a very minute part of the political spectrum, very, very small, as opposed to a much larger part of the Republican spectrum. But they do justify violence at much higher levels. And so I would say that you know if you had a Trump victory uh, and it looked like it was in any way unfair. It looked like there was uh, election suppression in some states or uh, some states maybe voided the uh, election results of certain urban centers as there's been legislation allowing them to do in places like Georgia or anything of that sort. You could expect that group, this kind of dissatisfied young male, mostly wealthy group to come out and enact violence that's mostly property crime. And my guess is that that would generate an equal and opposite reaction from a much better armed right wing that was much more organized for violence. And what you would get was uh, the kind of thing you got with the BLM protests, where there was also most of them peaceful, but a small amount quite violent. And you got a reaction from the right and that that violence would metastasize because the, the dynamics of violence are such that once you get a little bit from one side, you'll get a lot more from the more heavily armed side that's more willing to normalize. Before I turn uh, back to Ben, uh, uh, do you want to talk about de-escalation strategies at this point, or is it? <laughs> well, you can turn to the others, and I'll organize my thoughts for, okay. for how to de-escalate. Ruth was right that you know there's ways to depolarize, and some of those are individual, but more of them are uh, reaching into the political level. I'll think about how to phrase that and come back to you. Okay, uh, let me let me come back to Ben. Uh, ben, you you alluded to the fact that of the four Trump indictments. Uh, two are being brought by the Biden Justice Department. Uh, you didn't mention that one is being brought by uh, a Democratic a Democratic Party elected um, district attorney in Fulton County, and and the other one being brought uh, by a Democrat in New York. Uh, seems kind of inevitable that um, uh, you're going to have some uh, cross party kinds of um, uh, indictments here. What's the alternative? Um, how do, how do you think that these indictments should proceed given the inevitable political conflict between the parties and um, you know given that that Trump can claim to his supporters that this is election interference, which is you know quite a rich use of that of that term. It is a rich use. but Rick, I think the toothpaste is out of the tube on the question. I mean, they are, all going to go along as the judges uh, in those cases want. I mean, I think that there is 
um, what, what you describe as providing um, sort of opportunities for Trump to, to discount the trials and to rev up his supporters is absolutely right. Um, I suspect that most people have seen the overlay between the calendar of the trials and the calendar of the Republican primaries, so that for better or for worse, the justice system writ large has meant that what happens in the courtroom is really going to be the Trump campaign. So even more so than 2016 or, or 2020, it's going to be a campaign of grievance uh, and really revenge. And the desire, again, by all by prosecutors of the opposite party to indict him has set up what, what really is going to be a, a contentious, dangerous situation. And does, does this suggest anything in terms of the strategy of how these uh, cases should be litigated? Um, so, you know, so, for example, um, the uh, the federal indictments, bo both of the federal indictments seem very pinpointed and kind of, you know, um, narrow in a way that would would make them streamlined and potentially they could get to trial more quickly. You look at the Georgia indictment, it's the sprawling 19 defendants, 41 counts, um, possibility of severance, different trials. Um, is there anything in terms of the legitimacy of the trial and its relation to the trials and the uh, and the the relationship to the campaign that tells us how these trials should be conducted and how we should think about their timing and their conduct. Well, first of all, I don't think the judges are going to take politics into consideration, at least not in any way, shape, manner, or form that that we're going to be able to see. Um, I do think that. Uh, it is unlikely that any of those trial dates will actually hold, with the possible exception of the Alvin Bragg uh, indictment for the Stormy Daniels work, which I think has, has already been largely discounted as an election factor in, um, in this case, unless Trump is vindicated or acquitted, in which case it, it, it makes him even stronger. Um, I think the uh, the the indictment in Washington about uh, the election conspiracy case uh, is the one that that actually stands to the chance of starting somewhere within the primary season still. Uh, but again, that's just because uh, the special prosecutor brought a very narrow case against one defendant and one count. Um, if I was Trump's lawyers looking at the Georgia case, I, I would just let that one go out with all the procedural motions that all 19 defendants are going to make and uh, what, what, a, what a kind of circus that's going to be that I think probably uh, endures to Trump's benefit because it is so large and because there will be uh, so many disparate rulings in it. And the fourth case, of course, is the is the classified documents case in Florida, uh, perhaps with the judge who's shown the most sympathy uh, for Donald Trump in, in past cases. And so I think it's really unlikely, although that seems to me to be the, the most slam dunk case against him, it, it's unlikely that that will actually take off before the election takes place. Ruth, let me come back to you on, uh, you talked about uh, how businesses and other uh, others were surprised when democracy slid into authoritarianism. Let me ask you about the slide back into democracy. So, you know, if you, if you think about um, what it is that helps people get out of this box, even after um, a, a government has sustained some damage, you know, what are the success stories and, and how can we use those success stories to try to avoid uh, a similar fate in the United States? Um, I mean, some of the success stories are from, you know, they're not applicable because they're kind of more old school dictatorships, um, which, you know, that the, the one party states or the military dictatorships, and that's not how things 
uh, work anymore. Um, but I think that uh, in all cases, um, rebuilding trust, um, trust in elections, trust in each other, um, depolarization that Rachel will talk about. Um, also, you know, restoring, this might seem like namby-pamby, but restoring hope that uh, politics can mean something again, that it's not just cynicism and, you know, like nothing is true and everything bad is possible, like in Putin's Russia. Um, and, and restoring those uh, horizontal networks that uh, are the backbone of civil society because authoritarians, whatever kind of state it is, it's all about the vertical, like literally the power vertical in Putin's Russia with him on the top. But the, the loyalty and the trust is supposed to go from the mass of people to the leader. And Trump, that was one of the first things in 2015 that, that uh, I saw Trump doing. And I thought, this is bad. This is very bad. And these, all of these, um, whether it's however successful it is, authoritarianism wants you to break those horizontal bonds of solidarity, of kindness, of empathy, and, and view others with suspicion. And so they develop institutions that kind of codify that suspicion by informers and bounties for like we are this happening. So you have to undo that um, with a counter messaging and counter initiatives, which is bridge building. Um, and and that, that has happened in the past. Um, but one interesting thing on this, if we take uh, Italy, which, you know, remained a democracy under Berlusconi, and, but he degraded democracy in, in, intense, in, in quite an intensive way. Um, and what worked to temporarily, because now we have a neo-fascist there, but what worked was he was banned from politics. So when he had his final corruption trial, uh, he, had, you know, he had over 20 indictments when he left and 13, 14 corruption trials. Um, <clears throat> he was convicted but then he was banned for politics for five years. And this is interesting. At the beginning, so he, this happened in 2013 and there was an election in 2013 and he had been uh, convicted on, I'm, I'm not even gonna remember all the uh, bribery, sex with an underage girl, uh, why, you know, fraud, all the many things. He was a multi-criminal like Trump. That year, his party almost won again. It lost by less than 1% because of the effectiveness of his propaganda and the witch hunt and all the things he had set up. And by the way, the, the slogans, the rationale, it's all the same. The witch hunt, the prosecutors are leftists. But after he'd been removed as a factor and with his, per so his personality cult had no, it had no leverage anymore because he couldn't come back to politics. That's what allowed, it was like the pressure was removed. And now Italy is a multi-party system. This is another problem for reason there's very few parallels. We only have these two giant parties, so it's a kind of fossilized situation. Um, but so removing the, the person from uh, being able to come back, it's important, rebuilding civil society, rebuilding trust and optimism, all of these things uh, have mattered, whatever the circumstances. I'm going to come to uh, the audience questions in a minute, and I'm going to start with one that's going to come back to Ruth about disqualification. Uh, but let me first come back to Rachel and ask about depolarization strategies. Sure. So, so let me thinking. Let me cite six, and I'll pick up where Ruth um, started about individual hearts and minds and depolarization, because she's absolutely right, and. Um, what we've seen overseas is that um, bridge building that works just for individuals doesn't work to, to bring conflict down um, because individual hearts and minds, it's as if you're on a dial where you can change your emotions by one degree at a time, 
but your institutions that you're a part of, your church, your business, your what have you, are on a dial that turns, you know, to five different settings. If you turn your dial by 20%, there's no other political party to vote for that's 20% different. So it doesn't matter from a voting standpoint. That individual change will quickly repolarize over time. So yes, we need work on individual hearts and minds, but it needs to be more about the cultural structures like is there a place for non-authoritarian Republicans to gather that's a political party um, where a kind of normie Republicans can go? Are there churches for evangelicals who don't want to support this kind of politicization of religion? Are there gun clubs for people who believe in guns for shooting pheasants and not shooting uh, other political party members? Um, masculinity and how, how we frame masculinity in a lot of uh, for us. So we need structures where these individuals who change their hearts and minds can gather, support one another, and then gradually affect the political realm for that to matter. Second, politicians. Um, Governor Cox of Utah is starting the um, year that he's the head of the National Governors Association to try some depolarization. It's really important. The knowledge that we have about rhetoric from political leaders normalizing violence is that they do. Um, their rhetoric really matters. And so um, the depolarizing rhetoric where they model that um, they can have disagreements and they can still not hate one another is really important. They need to do it in a believable fashion. And so there's some good research on how they can make that more believable, but we need politicians to set better norms. And that gets to the incentive structures for politicians. Right now, the incentive structures with 90 plus percent of our seats being safe seats are to play to your base. And so that's a polarizing incentive structure. So on the electoral front, we need alterations to voting to allow that a tiny percentage of hyped up primary voters don't control the options for everyone. That's hard in an environment in which people already distrust the voting systems. Now you're gonna go futz with the voting systems. So I get that that's a problem, but consider California has 22 million registered voters, about 5 million are Republicans and about 5 million express no preference. They get effectively no vote. Texas has 6 million Republicans in the last uh, presidential election, 5 million Democrats, effectively no vote. That's the two party system, winner take all majoritarian system. And so changing that to a more ranked choice voting, which my native Alaska recently moved toward or a um, more proportional representation system so that more people get represented can have an effect on those incentives for politicians. I'll name just two more quite quickly. Um, reporters. Reporters need to complicate their stories. Our reporting class has gotten um, really uh, lazy in part because that the click to view kind of structure of our media is not helping them. But for instance, lots of people reported on this Richmond, North of Richmond song as if it was this Republican anthem. Well, it turns out the singer did launch a Republican anthem and he's not Republican. Um, and was upset that his song was used that way. That is an interesting story. We need to tell that story. Um, one of the things that we see in other countries where populist authoritarians take over is that afterward, as Ruth was just saying, you can get a moderate in if they win an election fairly, but they often only last one term because they're really boring. Um, a moderate after a populist authoritarian looks like a normal politician and it's hard to get reporters to cover them. And so the reporters go for the glitz of another populist authoritarian. And over time, you get them on both sides, which is what Italy is now dealing with, kind of left and right wing populists. So finding a way for reporters to not just run after glitz is important. And finally, um, narrative. America needs an aspirational story again. Why should anyone care about democracy other than those of us who professionally care about democracy? Um, most people don't know. And so we need a story about how America can really be made great again and why this tool for electing our leaders has served us so well for 250 years and why it needs revitalization and not throwing out. A lot of young people on both sides of the aisle don't really understand that part of it. They just want to win. That's about power, but it's not actually about the structure of the system and why it matters. So we need an aspirational story that tells that again for people who didn't remember totalitarianism personally. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to turn to the audience questions. And I'm going to start with one uh, related to an issue that we're going to be doing uh, uh, an event that I'll be announcing soon about um, Trump's potential disqualification under the 14th Amendment. So Section 3 of the 14th Amendment says that you can't run for office if you participate in insurrection or gave aid or comfort to those. And it was a post-Civil War measure. And now there are uh, lawsuits and potential 
administrative actions coming where this issue is going to be presented. It wouldn't be surprising if this issue uh, came up to the Supreme Court. There are lots of legal questions. As I said, we'll be exploring those later on. I want to talk about the political implications of this decision being made. In particular, you know, uh, Ben talked about partisan prosecutors. These decisions may be made by partisan secretaries of state, by elected judges in different states, ultimately ending up at a Supreme Court that has six Republican appointed justices and three Democrats. How is all of this going to work? And, and is this is it more dangerous to go just just as a political matter to go down this road uh, than to let the people decide uh, about the question of Trump's disqualification in 2024? Should it come to that? Um, maybe, Ben, I'll, I'll start with you. You're muted. I hate being muted. Um <laughs> I, I think this is certainly the discussion du jour. And uh, I think there's no question but that Article 3 of the 14th Amendment is still in effect uh, and that if someone committed insurrection, they, they should not be president. Um, but I have problems with this. I'm afraid it's putting the democracy at risk in order to save it, um, as the Wall Street Journal editorial said this morning. But my concerns with it fall into two buckets. Number one, you have to commit an act of insurrection. And other than um, uh, elitist law professors and partisan Democrats and people who really hate Trump, uh, no one, no court, no body has found that he was involved in an insurrection. The U.S. Senate, the only official body to deal with the issue, did not find that he engaged in insurrection. Um, the um, No court has found that. And Jack Smith, the special counsel, who's looked at more evidence than all of us put together, did not indict him for insurrection, just for conspiracy. And there is a difference between conspiracy and insurrection, um, which means that this will fall, as you said, Rick, to a partisan secretary of state maybe a lawyer, maybe not a lawyer, who will, uh, in a very partisan fashion, uh, try and take away the people's right to vote for a candidate. So the second bucket of concerns is what this does to the country and to the democracy. I mean, the elites telling half the country that they can't vote for their candidate of their choice is, I think, a dangerous precedent. And speaking of dangerous precedents, if this becomes normalized that you can charge your political opponents with committing insurrection, any majority can um, can go ahead and, and do this. So I, I'm, I'm afraid that the overall impacts of this and how it unravels are really, really going to be harmful. And taking this up to the U.S. Supreme Court um, without any lower court rulings or factual developments uh, is, I think, pretty dangerous. And as you noted, it was a 6-3 majority. And if this goes to the Supreme Court and they find uh, that, that Trump does have to be on the ballot, then that's a huge vindication for him. So in the, in the, in the name of depriving people of the ability to, to vote for their candidate, they're also giving them a political victory. Do others want to weigh in on this question uh, in terms of um, I'm, I'm not that you're, you're not. I know, Ruth and Rachel, you're you're not uh, attorneys, but not on the legal question, but on the, the political question of having this kind of disqualification uh, run forward. Um, I, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I think when, when uh, Ben says that uh, it's dangerous because other people could try it, I mean, whatever we want to call January 6, I call it a coup attempt. And you look at what happens to countries where uh, we are very, and we're not unusual in having a self coup, which is what technically it was, but it's very unusual that the person's like still going around two years later. Now we've been, you know, prosecuted for other things, but uh, with no, with no judicial blowback. And this is what's allowed the radicalization of the GOP and they're drunk with the fact they could get away with crime, which is the essence of authoritarianism to proceed. 
and it would be very difficult for others to replicate the assault on the Capitol. Um, I think that given that Trump is uh, a, an individual who has been able to debase the party by um, kind of imparting to them that that you can get away with things and that's a success and lawlessness is a is a badge of honor. Um, I think it's very important to uh, to use the rule of law and whatever um, mechanisms there are to push back on this because we know what happens when the lawless uh, get to power and they uh, and they are the only voice that can be heard. And I'll just chime in that um, there are no good options at this point. And I think we just have to level set with that. The best option is that Biden wins a free and fair election and Trump doesn't believe him and does what was done in 2020 to further uh, deepen electoral doubt. That's the best option. Maybe second best is that Republicans step away from Trump now, which is unthinkable, um, and have someone else run in his place so that they don't end up in a bad situation. Other than that, all the options become pretty bad. You end up with a convicted felon winning the popular vote, and maybe then Democrats try Section 14 or uh, Amendment 14. That would be really bad after someone has already won. Try it now before so that Republicans can have a, a vote for someone they believe in. And it looks like Lula in Brazil, who's been disqualified when he's quite popular before people get to vote. So at this point, we're looking at least bad options. And as Ruth says, we, we see overseas that more militant support for democracy can work. Um, Germany has really pioneered the, that in its post-Nazi era um, because they really took a lot of responsibility for what happened after Nazism and thought about how to stop it. But, um, but in a world of bad options, showing whose side the state is on is important. The problem in America is that we don't really have a head of state. We only have a head of government. We don't have kind of a monarch or someone who can stand for the people in a way that's separate from partisanship. And not that I believe in monarchy, but boy, would it be nice to have someone that was a little bit above all this fray that could set some cultural norms at this point. We only have four minutes left and there are eight other questions, but a few of them relate to the question of the role of the media. Rachel's already alluded to that briefly in talking about, I think you said uh, reporters need to show nuance. Uh, ben and Ruth, uh, in a minute, is there something you think the press should be doing that it's not doing or something they should stop doing? Uh, Ruth, let me come to you first on the press. Yeah, I think um, what unfortunately what's happened is uh, the press, which was uh, has been the object of severe attacks, has internalized a kind of caution and moved like CNN, moving more to the center or trying to uh, become more both sides ish. And um, that that doesn't work to deter right-wing violence, but only encourages it. Um, um, and so also the press is still doing far too much uh, both sidesism and um, just stuck in a paradigm that's not useful to deal with the GOP as an autocratic force. Ben, give you the last word. Uh, I wish the, the press and, and perhaps anti-Trumpers would learn the lesson of the last two and a half years. Despite the press, and I kind of disagree with the both sidesism. I think that the, the slice of the press that probably everybody on this call consumes every day has been adamant in calling out Trump. And the truth of the matter is that his, the number of people who disbelieve in elections has only grown in that time. And that's a lesson that we've got a completely polarized media environment with different audiences. And the failure of the popular press to actually take into account, listen and provide um, a forum so it can be rebutted to the election deniers is causing uh, increased polarization and a lack of communication and rising numbers for election denialism. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. It's a lot of things to think about. I appreciate all of you participating. A reminder of our upcoming events uh, in the chat box, you can find a link or you can just go to safeguardingdemocracyproject.org. Our next event is going to look at social media platforms and uh, election speech. That's going to be on September 26th. I'm Rick Hassan. Thank you all. 
Thank you, uh, Ruth, Rachel, Ben, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks.